and the first larger than life though so he's actually beaming in not from New Hampshire but from Denmark from Aarhus and this is my dear friend Paul my dear friend and collaborator we met first in Cork in southwest Ireland too many years ago his glittering CV is well known to you all. Since this is a Sparta session, I would single out his work on Spartan economy. And secondly, his work in Spartan epigraphy, his radically, I would say, revised view of the Damono inscription of the either late fifth or early fourth century, a long, long inscription, very unlaconic. And um, this is published on the web uh, through Histos, of which I believe the editor is, again, a mutual dear friend, John Marincola. And he's going to talk to us today about Amomparitos and the unruly Sparta at Plataea. You've had his abstract. He's going to talk for circa 20 minutes and then we'll pitch in. Paul, over to you. Thank you so much. I'm going to share the screen. Let's just make sure that I can't see, but I presume you can see. Oh, okay. great. Yeah, I can't see myself. So I, all I can see is your screen. <laughs> You've been watched it. And you, and you. There we go. We got the most important things going. <laughs> Let's, let me echo what Paul said very briefly and just say thanks to Natasha and everybody at CHS for organizing a splendid conference. And thanks to Paul for presiding over the festivities. So uh, let me just start by saying, I think if we thought about what's the point of the conference, why does it exist? The premise of the conference is that the Battle of Plataea is an historical event of special significance, at least to the residents of Europe and North America, even to the present day. And we could certainly frame an argument that Plataea had major geopolitical ramifications in both the short and the long term, ramifications that still reverberate today. But my approach to the Battle of Plataea for this conference comes from an entirely different direction. For someone like myself interested in the structure of Lacedaemonian society in the archaic and classical periods, Plataea is of special significance for two reasons. It created stresses that exposed fractures and tensions inherent in the relationships among Spartiates, and it did so outside of Sparta in front of a large audience and at an event that was remembered in some detail. As a result, this, what happened at Plataea gives us an invaluable glimpse of a fundamental dynamic in Sparta that is otherwise largely hidden. Now, the traditional and still widely accepted view of the Spartiates is that they were a highly disciplined and highly unified group that put a special premium on obedience and subordinating personal interests to the well being of the group as a whole. And I am myself an adherent of that view up to a point. I have, for example, in the past, argued that the Spartiate lifestyle had strong elements of the kind of disciplinary systems brilliantly delineated by Foucault, and that those systems inculcated habits of unquestioning obedience. I have, however, become convinced that what we might call the disciplinary aspect of Spartiate life existed as a necessary counterpart to a powerful tendency for Spartiates to dissolve into a mass of highly atomized self-seeking individuals who were at best disobedient and at worst ungovernable. And in the interest of simplicity, I'll talk about those two aspects of Sparta as the disciplined Sparta and an unruly Sparta. Now the signature incident at Plataea for unruly Sparta is Amumferitus's refusal of direct orders issued by the Regent Pausanias. And let's see who there we go, it's a an Angus McBride classic there <laughs> of dubious historical accuracy, but nonetheless, and stri visually striking. So that part of Herodotus's narrative, as we all know, has given rise to an enormous amount of scholarship and discussion in, at this conference already. And it's done so mostly because it stands in stark contrast to the prevailing picture of a disciplined Sparta. As Lazenby noted, Herodotus' statements about Amonferitos are, and I quote, usually dismissed on the ground that no Spartan officer would have behaved in so insubordinate a way as Amonferitus is said to have done, end quote. And Amonferitus' insubordination is seen as completely incompatible with Herodotus' statement that the Spartans subsequently decorated Amonferitus for bravery. 
So how does that leave us? Well, Herodotus' claims about Amun Feritas are typically explained in, in a relatively limited number of ways. It's been argued that Herodotus was misled by a highly biased Athenian source seeking to justify why the Athenians disobeyed orders to move to the island. It's also been argued that in describing the Amun Feritas incident, Herodotus was reworking the famous argument between Achilles and Agamemnon in book one of the Iliad. So it's really more literary flourish than historical account. And I think that the most common solution is to picture or to reconfigure Amun Feritas as an obedient Spartiate officer commanding a rear guard detailed to protect an orderly retreat by a disciplined Lacedaemonian army. I'm going to go somewhat different and say uh, we should take um, Herodotus mostly at his words. And leaving aside some possibly minor embellishments, it seems to me at least entirely plausible that Amun Feritas disobeyed a direct order from his commanding officer. I note in particular that as Thucydides informs us at the Battle of Mantinea in 418, two Spartiate polemarchs refused a direct order from King Aegis on the verge of the battle itself. And King Aegis was then forced to modify his tactical plans for the battle. And there, once again, we have senior Spartiate officers refusing a direct order from a commanding general on a battlefield. And no one, as far as I know, has questioned the veracity of Thucydides' account. We have two relatively similar incidents. Now, Thucydides states that the two polemarchs at Mantinea were subsequently convicted of cowardice and banished from Sparta, which obviously contrasts with the fate of Amun Feritus. But Amun Feritus was killed in the fighting at Plataea. And Herodotus tells us that Aristodemus, who had been shamed as the sole survivor of the Spartiates at Thermopylae, he appeared on numerous occasions yesterday, was killed fighting bravely at Plataea and was nominated for an award for courage, but was denied because he had left ranks. And so it doesn't seem especially unlikely, therefore, that Amon Feritus could have been decorated for bravery after a display of notable martial valor following an act of disobedience. And I note in this regard, just as a com comper on them, a, a section in Pericles' funeral oration. Let's see if we can pull that up. There we go. Pericles here is talking about what kind of people these are who are being buried. And he says, I believe that death such as theirs has been the true measure of a man's worth. It may be the first revelation of his virtues, but it is at any rate their final seal. For even those who come short in other ways may justly plead the valor with which they have fought for their country. The idea is that a final act of valor erases all previous misbehaviors. So I don't know so that it's terribly difficult to imagine Amun Feritus falling under that same heading. And as, as was touched on yesterday, but which I think is not sufficiently emphasized in the relevant scholarship on Plataea, is Pausanias was young, almost certainly in his 20s, an inexperienced and a regent rather than a king. And Amun Feritus, you know, depending on how one reads the sections at nine, 985 and, and how it's one, what's to do, but in my view, at least, Amun Feritus was a regimental commander and almost certainly older and considerably more experienced than Pausanias. And he may have well been, therefore, more bold than he would have been if he had been dealing with an older battle-tested king at the scene at the time. And you may think, OK, well, is it feasible for us to imagine Spartiates treating their kings in this fashion, right? Can Spartiates really behave in this fashion? And I thought in that vein, it would be useful just to go back relatively quickly and think a little bit about the behavior and the fates of Spartiates king, Spartia kings and regents in the general time frame of Plataea. So let's take a look at some of our cast of characters here. We have Cleomenes, who is put on trial after the, put on trial after the Battle of Sapia by the Ephors on the charge of having been bribed, and he's acquitted. But when the plot against Demaratus is revealed, he flees to Thessaly and then to Arcadia. He ends up stirring up rebellion in, in, uh, in Arcadia against Lacedaemon. He's brought back to Sparta, and he ends up dying in confinement. His not-so-good friend Demaratus is, gets deposed, then flees to Sparta, and the Spartan authorities try to arrest him en route. He escapes and lives out his life in Sparta, uh, in Persia. Laotychidas, the other part of our little sort of love triangle here, was condemned by a Spartan court to be handed over for the, to the Egonetans for punishment. The Egonetans don't do that. 
He subsequently charged with taking a bribe while commanding a campaign in Thessaly. He's sentenced to permanent exile. His house in Sparta is demolished and he dies in exile in Tesia. It's, uh, I think it's very likely that the general mistrust of Laetychidas in Sparta in 479 is how Pausanias ends up in charge of the army at Plataea, right? They don't trust Laetychidas. They need to find another commander, even though Pausanias is probably in his mid twenties and doesn't have a lot of experience. He's gotta be better than Laetychidas, who no one likes and has his own issues. But we're not done, right? Pausanias the region, we all know about him, so we don't have to do that very quickly. He's charged with conspiring with Persia. He's imprisoned and released. He's charged with conspiring with the Helots and he's starved to death in Sparta at the sanctuary of Athena Halkioikos. Pausanias, his son, Plistoanax, who ends up on the throne, he is uh, charged with taking a bribe on campaign against Athens. He's fined, he goes into exile. He lives in the Lycaon sanctuary because he's terrified of being seized by the Spartan authorities. He's ultimately recalled, but never really comes back into good odor. King Aegis, we've already talked about being disobeyed, but before the Battle of Mantinia, he was blamed for failing to engage the enemy in the Argolid. The Spartiates wanted to, with evidently without a trial, raise his house and fine him. And Aegis persuaded them not to do so, but after that, he couldn't, he couldn't leave, uh, couldn't take an army out of Sparta without the permission of 10 counselors. And finally, Pausanias, the, the grandson to finish the set, put on trial after restoring democracy, he's acquitted and then condemned to death after Haliartus. And I went through all those in a little bit of detail just to try to get some, try to put together a little bit of a mass of evidence about the behavior and treatment of Spartia kings. Because the way the Spartia kings are behaving, and I think more, more to the point, the way they are treated by other Spartias, uh, more than half of them in the fifth century end up on trial for something at some point and, uh, and not in trivial consequences. That sort of treatment of Spartia kings is notably dissonant with our picture of a disciplinary Sparta, particularly since the Spartia kings held hereditary and religiously sanctioned positions that one might have thought automatically conferred on them great influence and rendered their position almost entirely secure but the opposite in fact seems to have been true. And the examples of this sort of unruly Sparta in action could be, could be multiplied. Lysander plotting to end the hereditary kingship, Gallippus embezzling state monies, being condemned to death and dying in exile. The Spartius is Facteria surrendering despite being expected and encouraged to fight to the death. And just to add top off the list, uh, the, Aristotle tells us that in some matter involving Andros, the ephors took bribes about doing something that threatened the, the very existence of the Lacedaemonian state. So we see Lacedaemonian leaders, almost the only ones who appear in the sources, uh, repeatedly misbehaving and being treated badly by the Spartans as a group. I would say that all of that's difficult to reconcile with the disciplinary Sparta in which everyone was obedient and everyone was deeply committed to the common good. So, for, we're not, there's not time today to dig into that argument at great length, but I think the, if we take that as a, the, as a given for the moment, the existence of an unruly Sparta, where Spartans behave badly on a regular basis, we could start thinking about a number of questions, only one of which I'll really tackle in today, which is, okay, so where did this unruly Sparta come from? In other words, what were the societal forces that created and sustained it? And um, my view, unruly Sparta was the result of the interaction of two fundamental strands of Spartiate society. On one hand, a commitment to in-group egalitarianism, and on the other hand, a commitment to in-group status competition. So egalitarianism and in-group status competition, which uh, in my view at least ended up being something of a toxic brew. Now, neither of those strands of Spartiate society require much explanation in the present context. As Finley pointed out in his fundamental 1968 article on Sparta, the Spartiates commitment to in-group egalitarianism was institutionalized in a common compulsory upbringing, a common compulsory withdrawal from economically product, uh, product, product, productive activity, a, constant, a shared concentration on military and civic duties, and a shared homosocial lifestyle built around membership in a sicitian. And obviously the Spartiates called themselves and conceived them themselves as homoioi, conspicuously similar, if not equal. 
And the Spartiates were also notably committed to in-group status competition. And this is repeatedly emphasized in the ancient literary sources produced by and about Spartiates. Just to give you two examples, the famous preamel in Tertius fragment 12 revolves around status competition. Tertius lists the various ways one might demonstrate arete, speed, strength, beauty, wealth, and rejects them all in favor of military valor. And the key issue in the present context is the assumption that there will be status competition and thus a need to establish on what grounds status could be won. And Tertius' words find echoes in, in Xenophon and the Lacedaemonian Politeia, where Philonikia is a constitutive element of the Spartiate upbringing and lifestyle. Now, it might seem prima facie that a commitment to egalitarianism would facilitate harmonious in-group interactions by reducing inequalities among Spartiates and related envy and resentment. But in point of fact, repeated studies of both animal and human groups have shown that egalitarian groups are particularly prone to intra-group conflicts. And if you're interested in the scholarly literature, I would suggest as a starting place an article published by Rone et al. In, the, in psychological science about 10 years ago. I'll give you just one quote from that article. I can get this thing to behave, there we go. Um, there, when there is a clear <clears throat> hierarchy, get ourselves organized, there we go. When there's a clear hierarchy, division of labor and patterns of deference reduce conflict, facilitate coordination and ultimately produce, pr improve productivity. When a clear hierarchy is absent, Competition, conflict, and lack of clear role differentiation undermine group coordination and performance, which is what they're saying essentially is when everyone's very much alike in status and role, which clearly fulfills the homoioi, there tends to be a lot of argument about who should be in charge about what, and everyone feels empowered to argue with everyone else all the time. And I think anyone, I think many amongst us uh, can speak to our own experience as academics that that is part of academic lifestyle, right? The lack of role differentiation and major status produces a, an endless amount of argumentation because everyone feels free and encouraged in some ways to speak their mind all the time and, and engage in what can frequently end up being some frequent uh, endless discussion bordering on bigger. I think we see that exact process at work among the Spartiates. That's their strong commitment to egalitarianism significantly reduced inequalities that otherwise would have contributed to the formation of hierarchy, which would in turn have muted, muted in-group conflict among the Spartiates. And the absence of those inequalities, that emphasis on similarity produced an unruly Sparta. And I note in the Finley article, as he, when he's thinking about what Spartiate society was like, he says, quote, Instead of equilibrium, there was permanent conflict. And I think that's a pretty good description of the situation. The, the similarities, both real and ideological, perceived among Spartiates when paired with the strong impulse towards status competition, which was everyone wants to be better than the next person, created something, I think, akin to Hobbes's war of all against all. Now, for Hobbes, that sort of endemic conflict sprang up in the absence of a sovereign authority and created a situation in which, as he famously said, life was solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. Now, I'm particularly interested in the solitary part of that. Because for, I picked Hobbes because I, I think this combination of egalitarianism and status competition had the pernicious effect of atomizing Spartiate society. Spartiates were sufficiently similar and sufficiently ambitious that there, were, that there was no stable hierarchy in the group in, in much of the time. It was a war of all against all. Everyone's at war with everyone else because we're all similar enough to aspire to the same things. And that in the sense was what is the crux, the heart of unruly Sparta. And that behavior that results from that would be more or less what we're talking about. I would say, just as an aside, but I think an important one, the disciplinary Sparta was an absolutely necessary counterpoint to the unruly Sparta. The training in obedience and subordination to the collectivity that's so much a part of Spartiate life was an absolute necessity in order to overcome the tendencies towards disobedience and selfish behavior embedded in the unruly Sparta, which was in turn embedded in the fundamental nature of Spartiate society. So they were two sides of the same coin. The disciplinary Sparta and the unruly Sparta existed together and necessarily in a kind of complementary pair. 
we, we, we tend to hear mostly about the, the disciplinary sport. There we go. Okay. Um, what I want to just conclude with today is by looking at a monument that in my view clearly reflects this atomization of Spartiate society. And this is the tomb of the Lacedaemonians in Athens erected to hold the Lacedaemonian casualties from 403. And that tomb held 23 skeletons and was erected in multiple phases over a short period of time. And we know from Xenophon and from an inscription that was originally placed on the tomb that its occupants included two polemarchs and one Olympic victor amongst the others. Now, what I care about here is that the burials display a considerable degree of differentiation. These 23 skeletons are chopped and sliced into tiny little groups within the tomb. Let me be a little bit more specific. The tomb was re-excavated in the early 2000s, and so we know, now know a lot more about it than we did. In the initial phase, there were two separate burial pits, and each burial pit had its own marker. In the second phase, they, cut, they took off the burial markers, and they built two separate structures on top, which are labeled here as the Kernbau and the Turnbau. The term bow held just a single individual provided with the only grave good found in the tomb as a whole, and who like, unlike all of the other interred individuals was buried in a sarcophagus. So right in the first round of burials, there's one individual who's singled out. Now who that is, it's almost impossible to tell. In fact, it is impossible to tell. When the, the Kern bow, the one that held more individuals was subdivided by an interior cross wall into two sections, one holding skeletons one through six and the other holding skeletons seven through nine. And you might think, well, that was just a structural wall. It doesn't really mean anything. But skeletons seven through nine have two stones under the head of each of the corpses, where skeletons one through six get just one stone. So there's some differentiation. And a large stone was placed on the north side of skeleton eight so that skeletons eight and nine were separated from skeleton seven. So even in that small little thing, they subdivided the group yet again. If we go to the right in the later extension, so they kept building out the tomb, skeletons 17 and 19 through 24 were all interred at the same time in the same part of the tomb, but 17 and 24 were given spatially distinct graves, whereas 19 to 23 share a single section of the tomb. If we take that sort of picture of a, of a group of 23 war dead who are chopped in, into at least a half dozen different distinct groups within the tomb, and we can, we, it was strikingly uh, different than what we know about Athens, right? As we all know, Athens, according to Thucydides, takes all of the casualties from each tribe and they're buried together in a single coffin so that there were 10 identical coffins. And the complete absence of distinction among the Athenian war dead is notable and obviously stands in sharp contrast to what we're seeing here where they're chopped into pieces, literally a figure, right? The Spartiates may have been theoretically a perfectly disciplined and perfectly united group, but when they're buried, they're buried in a highly atomized fashion. So let me wrap this up by saying that when we go back where I started, uh, for, from my perspective, Plataea dragged the Spartiates out of the shadows of Laconia and into something resembling full historical daylight. And the face the Spartiates showed to the world was the disciplinary Sparta. And that became the dominant image of the city and its inhabitants. But the Greeks at Plataea got a glimpse of the other hidden face of Sparta, the unruly Sparta, the kind of place where faced with an existential threat, the, Lacedae the Lacedaemonians, the Spartiates appoint a young and inexperienced regent to lead the army because the older, more experienced king had gained his position through deceit and corruption and nobody trusted him. And the sort of place where a regimental commander could refuse a direct order. And if our sources don't often show us this unruly Sparta, that's because the Spartiates were adept at concealing it from the outside world. But in my view, that does not diminish its importance and our understanding of ancient Sparta. Thank you. I'm going to leave it right there. Thank you very much indeed. And if we can come back. I'm going to stop sharing this too. Just... Yeah, that would be nice. Thank you. There we go. Hello, everybody. Right. I'll just, as chair, make a couple of uh, initial uh, reactions. First of all, as I said last night, how reliable is Herodotus? Well, the one bit of Sparta, the one he calls it a demos, uh, 
not an Oba or a Kome that he says he visited. And this is one of the only three named informants in the entirety of the work. In uh, book three, chapter 55, he visits Archias, mm -hmm. very good distinguished uh, aristocratic, I would say, name, in Pitana. Now, my, my question to you, Paul, is, might he not have been, or might he have been, unusually reliable on matters to do with Pitana? So if he speaks of a Pitanate Locos, that's what his informant told him. Question to you. Uh, I've, got a, well, I've got a supplementary. I've got a supplementary. Okay. Well, Marcello is here. Marcello has. I, well, that's exactly it. I just went back and reread Marcello's articles on this today, which I had read with great interest uh, before, and went back. Um, I tend to be an Occam's razor sort of person, which is that I, when all, when, when I, I just prefer the simplest explanation. And you may accuse me of being simplistic, and that you know could go the other way too. Um, I, I yes, I, I am. I. It, would be happy to go down the path that you've laid out that there was something resembling a pitonite locos. Now, whether or not, and I, I think Marcello has made a very powerful argument for at least early Sparta having a tribal military organization with three major units, which were tribal rather than, um, rather than territorial, but um, that there was probably some overlap between the two, right? That they were tribally based, but there was a rough geography to the tribes so that there was a territorial informal overlay over the tribal units. In which case, finding a pitonate locos doesn't seem all that problem. Um, I'm, inclined to, I'm inclined to take Herodotus at his word on for that, on that part. So I'll, let me leave it there because obviously that could be a whole conference amongst itself. So let me just leave it there and we'll go and let's take the next thing. Well, it is the subject of our next paper, it is. But right. um, there is one dimension of your paper which directly follows from or relates to Marcello's view. Marcello, as I understand him, is of the view that Amonferatus was likewise, like Pausanias, young, under 30. I, on the other hand, agree with you <laughs> that I think he was not anything to do with the hippies at all, and that he was older. But I just put that out. People have to make up their own minds whether it's more likely that an older man would have challenged the then regent. Okay, he's not king, but remember, presumably Pausanias got the hippies along with Leotikidas when needed, and therefore he would still be commanding Amonferatus if Amonferatus were a hippies. And I don't think a regular member of the hippies would have taken on Pausanias. That's my humble opinion, and Marcello maybe wants to come back on that. Anyway, <laughs> enough about me. First of all, Paul, the other, the you know, yet another Paul, Bardunias, please. Thank you very much. One of the things we see in, um, for instance, primate groups when you disrupt these hierarchies is you get the formation of fluid coalitions. And, and I'm curious in this setting, I've always wondered how much of this is individual insubordination, how much of it is uh, sort of spontaneous intergroup fighting, and how much of it is almost strategic embarrassment of the other group by not following these orders, right? I mean, if things had worked out differently, it may have really embarrassed Pausanias, right? So what do you think? Um, I think I think you're I think you're right on the mark there, which is this um, there there's clear emphasis in Sparty life and humiliating people, right? You think, you know, think about Demaratus, right? Poor Demaratus is deposed and Leotychidus is just smashing it into his face in public, <laughs> right? And you see that a lot, right? So I, I think part of I th what, um, what's sometimes called the Greek contest system is, it's sort of, I, I tell my students, it's like uh, high school rankings. You can't move out without someone else moving down, right? There can only be one valedictorian. So if you wanna be valedictorian, whoever's there has gotta come down. So one way is to move up, but another way to move up is just to knock someone down by mocking them, by humiliating them, by putting them in a terrible position. And so that's not hugely surprising, but since we tend to think of the Spartans as being totally obedient and totally focused on the group, but if we look at Spartan life, they're, they're doing an awful lot of things which are incredibly self-seeking and damaging to the group as a whole, 
And I think what I'm trying to argue is that you just that needs to be institutionalized in a sense in our understanding of Sparta, that this is just part of the way they operate. They're quite vicious with each other yeah. to the point where I said no one questions that at Mantinia, two of the Polemarchs, right before the battle starts, basically tell us to go screw himself. They're like, listen, no, I'm not doing it. And so um, I, I think that there was a lot of that. And my guess would be that if you were to talk to one of the Spartan kings and said, oh, you know, you have got all this power and influence, they'd be like, yeah, sure. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Thank you. It, it also makes me wonder about other events where Spartans sort of fail to pull off maneuvers or something goes wrong, like that Lutra, right? Or at Kokira, where they, they fail to move men. And I always wonder if there's this inertia, not of tactical ability, but of you know, ability to follow orders, right? Well, and think about Sphadrius, right? What is Sphadrius up to exactly? Do you know, would you expect an American military commander just to launch an attack in peacetime without, without any orders? It's crazy behavior. Without but if you're, <laughs> if you're a self-seeking <laughs> individual, it's like, listen, I, if, I, if it works, great for me. If not, eh. Well, you know, we did see a little of this in World War II with like General Clark pushing onto Rome. I mean, this, this, these do happen even in modern times, yeah. I just think it was a lot worse in Sparta. As I said, <laughs> it just, it's mostly just trying to nuance this picture that the Spartans always do, which is why I think what Lazenby is saying, the reason why we don't believe in the Amun Feratus episode is that it just doesn't fit our picture of Sparta. But, yeah. but maybe the picture, it's not, maybe the but, problem is not Herodotus, but our picture of Sparta that needs to be adjusted. I, I have always said that instead of 300, they should have done a movie on like 90210 with Spartan cast because that's, <laughs> More accurate. <laughs> I, I see a screenplay coming, Paul. So <laughs> we must move on, I'm afraid. Roll, please. Thank you very much. It was really interesting. I really appreciate the perspective of the idea that these egalitarian societies are actually really prone to internal conflict. And I think that maps very well onto the dysfunction of a lot of Greek armies, really. Um, so what I'm interested in is that the Spartan army, obviously, in Greek history stands out for being the only one that does have a really elaborated officer hierarchy. And that does consequently, you know, have the ability to follow orders in battle, even though they sometimes don't, which creates these really, really paradoxical scenes that you described. What I'm wondering is how do you, like, do you have any idea of, or maybe these anthropological models offer some answers to this, but how is this imposed? Like, how do you get an egalitarian community to accept hierarchy like that? Because clearly the Athenians never figured this out. Right, I'm sorry, I should have put the screen up. So I wrote an article about this back in 2012. So um, it's in classical antiquity. The question is, and that's why I was talking about Foucault. So I think there's a good argument to be made that Spartans put together, the Spartans put together something which looks pretty much identical to what Foucault would call a disciplinary system, which by endless training teaches you a habit of obedience. And so there, and that's the point of the upbringing, right? They're all gonna be taught the same thing, this habit of obedience through a system of regimented training and scheduling. And the question is a conversation for another day role, but the question is which came first, the chicken or the egg, right? In this case, my view is that the unruly Sparta came first, that the commitment to egalitarianism came and then they discovered they had a problem which would no one would listen to anybody. And so the question, then how do you get some sort of coordination? Well, then you need a compulsory education system and this endless emphasis on obedience and in my view, the story that you hear about Lycurgus, right, that there was Sparta was the worst governed place and then became the best governed place is exactly the ideological necessity to enforce this disciplinary regime, which is to say, if, I know you don't like it, but here are the consequences. The consequences are complete dysfunction. Thank you very much. Uh, Yanis, please. Thank you. Yes, we are told that uh, Porsenia's chooses every Anax as he uh, co-commander. Yeah. Uh, who is every Anax? What do we know of him? Is he an older man that is going to counterbalance, for example, Amon Faritus or someone else? No, he's, he's Amon Faritus' first cousin. He's in the same generation, in the same family. So he just picked someone, he picked his first cousin to be his, his commander, his second in command, which was not an obvious choice if you're really front and center concerned about the army, but if you're worried about your own status, then you don't want to pick someone older who might push, push you around, take the model of Agesilaus and Lysander in the 390s in Asia Minor, right? 
you don't want to get pushed around. So you pick someone your own age. And in fact, your own first cousin, who's definitely not going to screw with you. So he was maybe um, expecting something like what actually happened from yeah. Amun Faradus? I would think that if you were a Spartiate king, you knew that people, because you were on the top of the hierarchy, people were after you a lot. And any sign of weakness was a problem. Almost all these trials come after moments of military failure or questioning on the part of the leader, because their, their leadership of the Sparta kings was mostly built around the army command. And if you've shown that you couldn't do that, then it was open season on you. So I, I don't think that Pausanias would have been terribly, in my view, I don't think Pausanias would have been terribly surprised by the Amun Faridus situation. That that sort of pushing back against uh, against people telling you what to do would not have been surprising, especially if Amun Faridus was older, a regimental commander. Pausanias has never led an army before. There's confusion in the middle of the night, and Amun Faridus says, no, I'm just not going to do it. <laughs> Thank you very much, John. John Highland. Thank you. Um, I have a, a couple of questions about Laotuchidas uh, and uh, where he fits into this, the, the reluctance to employ him in command. Um, one thing I was thinking with uh, is the question about uh, Demaratus's presence in the uh, Persian army, uh, at least with Xerxes. We, we don't really know uh, where he is, or, or is he back at Sardis already um, in 479? Um, is there a sense that the Spartans are reluctant to use Laotuchidas because Demaratus can threaten his authority uh, in some sense as, as being the uh, the proper king um, whose, whose deposition is based on a, a falsehood uh, and a religious scandal. Um, and on the other hand, though Laotuchidas is appointed to the naval command, which, which really is prestigious in its own right. Um, and could, I mean, can there be a push between those two factors? Uh, on the one hand, reluctance to use him on the other, the sense that the polis has to show uh, a common unity between the two royal houses. Absolutely. So I think those, those, the two facets of Sparta are in constant interplay and tension. You can't have one without the other. They're sort of both. But if you have just one part of the picture, it's hard to understand what's going on. So it just needs, the other part needs to be raised up. I, I don't think that, I've, I don't think that anyone in Sparta thought that the naval command was the better of the two jobs. The, right. So, but, but it was still an important job, nonetheless. Um, and the kings maintained a lot of influence, right? When they're about to drag off Laotychidas, the Aegonetans, someone says to them, listen, I wouldn't do that if I were you, because sooner or later, they're going to get mad about what you did to one of the kings. So is there a certain amount of respect? Absolutely. But um, not, I think Leo, I, I've never thought about the issue with Laotychidas and Laotychidas and uh, Demaratus, that's a really interesting one. Uh, I'll have to think about that one some more, but I think I, I'm initially persuaded. And of course, there's some amusement, right? That on if you think about Thermopylae, there's a Spartan king on both sides. Like, how do you get there? How do you have a Spartan king on both sides of the same battle, exactly? Good point. Uh, Thank Natasha, you. finally. <clears throat> Yes, thank you so much, Paul. This is fantastically interesting. I wanted to um, somehow uh, say that um, this unruly component that you described so well, in a way, it is at its apex in the uh, unit of hippies, right? Because this is the place, if we believe what Xenophon writes about it, you like there is this continuous challenging, which just sort of unrelentlessly doesn't stop for a moment. And like we, we continually have 300 people who like kind of coming up on top. Um, and uh, I wonder, you know, like whether uh, this actually might. Uh, kind of like make us understand this picture of perhaps Amon Faratos as a uh, leader of the hippies. Because he is somehow, once again, if we believe Xenophon, which is of course not uh, automatic, um, the leader, the Hippogratoi are also part of the uh, Hebontes. So they are also the same age. They are just sort of like chosen, not from like 
uh, they, they are more part of the disciplinary system, though, which is also mm, meritocratic. But he is continuously sort of dealing with this sort of like hyper testosterone um, group of people who are proving themselves. I think the hippies, the higher the stakes, you know, the more bitter the competition and the hippies were a position of particular prominence. And I would, at least I would think it seems to me highly probable that being selected to the hippies in your 20s was like being fast tracked into the upper echelons of the government for the rest of your life. And so the stakes are incredibly high. My recollection is, Mar and Marcello may, may uh, correct me, that uh, that Xenophon tells us that they had to be over 30, right? They had to be the uh, Maxuntos. Yeah. Uh -huh. Who had to be over 30? The Hippogreta. But I may be wrong. I haven't. The, uh, the Hippogreta were among the Ipes. That is probably in the last year among the Ipes, 30 years old. But there we go. Right. So just at, the, just at the, uh, the, uh, the other end. So just like full adults, however one thinks about that. But um, in my sense, the hippies are just a microcosm of how this thing works as a whole, right? Because they, it's the way the society is structured, and that elite group doesn't look much different, just on a slightly more um, high stakes way. 